Hello, learning designers. Welcome back to the Learning Design Summit. Pleasure to see you all back in here for today evening's session. I have Peter Leeson also joining me live from UK. Hello, Peter. Hello, Aman. Hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever it is where you are. <laughs> Hello, Aditi. Good to see you. Hello, Bogdan. Hello. Please feel free to also let me know from where are you logging in. Hello, Jane. Hello, Jackie. I see you writing. Good morning. This is the first one I've been able to make. Will there be a recording sent to participants? Of course, Jackie, there's going to be a replay available for all the sessions that are happening. If you have missed the live session, do not worry. We've got you covered. If you go on to the uh, learningdesignsummit.com uh, website, there is a replay section there. Uh, feel free to look at all the replays uh, for the sessions that have happened. And replays will be available for the time that the summit is live. After that, they will be pulled down. So make sure you visit all the replays. Uh, I mean, visit, see all the replays before the summit gets over. I'm concerned by Paul's message, who says he can't hear anything. OK. Paul, you can't hear a thing. All right. So would you like to, you know, I know you would have already done that, but check your speakers. Uh, just want to check with everyone else. Can you guys hear us fine? I'm not sure if uh, there is some problem at our end that we can fix. Hello, Jane from uh, Jane Leonard from Ireland. Good to see you. Paul, you could let me know, uh, but of course you can't hear me. So how would you know? Hello, Anuj. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Pankaj Kumar. Hello, Kiara. Good to see you back. OK, Jackie is saying the audio is great. Aditi is saying absolutely she can hear us. It's audible. OK, Paul, you could let us know if it's getting a little better for you. Dr. Anthony Basil is also in the house. Uh, hello, Dr. Anthony Basil. Good to see you. Hello, Isabel from South Africa. You can hear us clearly. Fantastic. Okay, OK, Paul, I think you can hear us well now. Fantastic. OK, and Jane's got an idea for you, Paul. Paul may need to click on the video to enable the speaker. I did not have sound until I did. OK, that's a good idea. Um, maybe that's what Paul did. Thank you so much for that, Jane. All righty. OK, Paul's all good. Fantastic. Hello, Rahul Agarwal. Good to see you. Gurpreet Pahuja, good to see you back. Hello there. Good morning, Douglas. Fantastic. So already a packed house, uh, Peter. Um, and it's just four minutes over. So people are going to keep joining us. And let's just take a minute and talk about the, um, you know, a little bit about the session that we are going to have today with Peter. So uh, let me just introduce in brief, uh, you know, Peter's profile. Peter has been in the industry for more than 25 years. He's uh, got massive experience in the area of quality. And today, he's going to uh, share his insights about how do learning designers um, you know, get sensitized about quality to begin with in their whole process. What are some areas? And they, you know, once his presentation starts, you will see that there are so many areas in which quality matters. And it just, it just is so important to pay attention to uh, um, so many of these areas and make sure that uh, you know the stuff that we are doing for our audiences, everything is ticked off. So, and and Peter's presentation was a great eye opener 
for us, uh, you know, once we had it the first time and we realized that there is so much out there for us to think about as a team. Um, and if you are concerned about quality and, uh, in, you know, you want to ensure that you get good pro quality products out to your audiences, then it's going to be a great session for you guys. So I would say all instructional designers, learning designers, training managers, training leaders, today's session is going to be massively important and relevant for you guys. Hello, Nand Kishore Mata. How's the weather in Hyderabad? I heard it's getting cold out there. It's getting cold out here in Gurgaon and it's uh, almost, I think, the coldest that it would get. Really very cold. That's why you see me in a coat today. I had a little bit of change of wardrobe since morning. Fantastic. So, uh, Peter, any words that you want to, uh, you know, start with uh, for our audience right now? First of all, I want to thank you, Oman, for making me younger than I am. I've actually been in the IT industry for over 43 years now. Oh, fantastic. You said 25. <laughs> um, uh, for the past, well, for most, of, for most of my professional career, I've been delivering training and presentations in one form or another and doing it more professionally in the past uh, 20 or so years. And I, I'm... I'm obsessive about quality because I believe that whatever products or services you are delivering, I can find them somewhere else and I can probably find them cheaper. We are competing in a global market. We're competing in people with people in every continent today because the internet is so powerful. And quality is what is yours. That is what differentiates you from everybody else. That's the only thing you have to sell, really. Uh, products and services I can find easily. But your quality, that's your trademark. And that's what keeps your people coming. And that's what keeps your clients faithful to you and talking about you and spreading your reputation. So that's, that's why I'm... I'm focusing on quality in whatever I do, because I really need to feel people to understand how critical it is. It's not just doing what you've been told to do. It's going beyond that. Fantastic. I think great words, uh, Peter. I, I love the way you, you know, uh, created that contrast that it's only quality that sells. And that's the only thing that differentiates any organization from another products and yes. services. You know, we are in an open marketplace. Everyone's competing with pretty much the same offerings in terms of features, but it's how you deliver it and the quality that you, um, you know, uh, quality that you deliver at the end of it. That's what makes a difference. So without uh, further ado, uh, Peter, I'm going to, uh, you know, start the presentation. And guys, uh, uh, Peter has been kind to stick around and he's going to be watching the chat area. So feel free to put in your questions either in the question and answers area or in this open chat area and uh, you know I will request Peter to uh, share his insights about the opinions and comments and questions that we all post to him and uh, post the session we will again come live and uh, we will take those up so guys happy um, viewing yeah. go ahead sir I want to add quickly that if you think of any questions afterwards and you want to contact me I've put my address on top of the public chat so you can reach me at info at pleason.co.uk. Fantastic. So guys, uh, good thing to make a note of very quickly. Uh, after the session, if you think of anything, uh, Peter is reachable. And that's what I love about experts in our industry. You know, the, the best experts out there are so approachable, so reachable. You know, it's just amazing to be part of this fantastic industry. Uh, so, guys, we'll just start off with the presentation and uh, uh, we'll be more than excited to look at your questions and answer them. Hello, learning designers. Welcome to the Learning Design Summit. It's a summit where practitioners and experts come together to share their expertise and secrets of their craft so that you can further your skills and better your career. So today we have Peter with us. Peter has been 
a IT consultant and a trainer for more than 40 years now. He's got experience of being an IT consultant for last 20 years, and he has been involved in, uh, you know, for his company doing various demos and pre-sales presentations uh, to various organizations. Peter, very interestingly, also is a, uh, was a professional cartoonist and also is a stage actor. So here we have a very interesting mix of somebody who has both the left brain and the right brain completely activated. And he's going to talk to us about quality and what quality really means for people who create uh, presenting materials and what is it that we should be thinking about and doing with our material to make it quality top notch. So Peter, welcome to the Learning Design Summit. I'm very Thank excited you. to have you with us. Thank you, good to be here. Okay, Peter, look forward to our session today. I want to understand from you, what is it, what is the case for quality? What is it that people do wrong when they create their material? And what are some things that you see and how does it really impact the whole effort that people put in in creating material? And, uh, you know, if the quality is not in place, what would you say about that? Quality is, is one of those extremely annoying things. People don't define it, don't design it. They just complain about it missing. And if you want to deliver, particularly in delivering training, you don't want people to just sit through your course and not really pay attention. They will lose attention. You need to get it back. You need them to really learn and feel they have got away with something additional. Quality means that you want your learners to come back to you. You want your learners to not only learn what you're teaching them to understand it, but actually come away and talk to others and say, you know, this was a really good course. I'd like, I, I, I recommend it. And that's how you can really grow. Listening to a lecturer is very tiring and often very boring, uh, particularly if we're talking e-learning. E-learning is very difficult to follow in most cases. And therefore, you need to really understand what quality means to you, to your course, to your learners, so that they can take away the most value possible. Fantastic. Peter, as I was also, uh, and this is a discussion we were having, you know, you have been recognized as a top speaker in various conferences and you have some massive stage presenting on stage experience. And, you know, what has been happening with training now that a lot of the uh, training that was earlier uh, delivered in person now is shifting into digital space. So, uh, you know, it makes the case for quality even stronger because, you know, somebody who is charismatic and is able to create engagement with live audience, all those elements are now missing in the self-paced environment of the e-learning. So why is why do you think learning designers of today who may have come from the pedigree of standing up and delivering training content who could who are now required to create uh, digital content why do you think quality is even more important for people who have such pedigree so the the whole concept of training and learning has changed being on stage, being in a classroom, using the space, getting the interaction is a fantastic tool that we are losing through the online learning. I don't know if people are listening to me. I don't know if they are reacting. I don't know if they are bored. I don't know if what I'm saying is too complicated or too simple for them. So I've got no direct feedback. I've got no real-time feedback. The training has to be designed for this new structure so that you are continuously recapturing the learner's attention with things that might not have been available in face-to-face in -face training 
you've got to find new ways of capturing their attention. You've got to find new ways of recapturing their attention because you will lose it. And in a classroom, if people are not paying attention and drifting off, I see that immediately. So I can do something about it. And that there are all kinds of tricks you can do on stage in order to recapture attention physically. E-learning, I can't see it. I have to be aware that I'm losing the attention of a number of people listening to me. I've got to try to recapture it, even if I don't, without sounding as if I know you're not listening, so therefore let me say this instead. It's a lot more subtle, it's a lot more difficult. Got that, Peter. Uh, also, Peter, I'm very excited to hear a little bit about your experience doing the pre-sales presentations that you have done across, you know, your career uh, spanning many decades. I believe that for any organization which is a, you know, IT service based or any agency, the pre-sales presentation really is the first foot in the door. And, you know, if your pre-sale presentations is not you know, where it needs to be, then, you know, you don't have customers, customers are not interested to speak with you any further and, and, and things like that. So what are some things that, you know, uh, if you look back, you would say that uh, these are the first lessons I learned, you know, as I was doing and preparing for my pre-sales presentation, which made you uh, very conscious of the quality, especially in the presenting uh, of, of material case. So as, as an IT uh, engineer, developer, um, program manager, and so on, I had to do the pre-sales. I had to stand up in front of audiences um, of four people or of 50 people. And probably the most important lesson I learned there is that I needed to know the product inside out. I needed a complete certainty of what the product could do, how to talk about it, how to present it in a way that sounded attractive. Every product has got failures, has got faults in it, we know that. Um, I had to know where the product failed so that I could avoid that in the pre-sales presentation. And just bring out the, the, the sexy pieces, make it look as something they want, and again, pay attention to reaction. And there's one thing which we avoid in online learning to a large extent, which is the most terrifying thing in face-to-face -face learning, and which is a, definitely a problem in demoing a product and that is the questions and answers at the end because the questions and answers is when some idiot is going to come up with the problem you have never thought of the question you have never considered and you mustn't lose face now depending on the relationship if I'm doing a classroom, I, I do a project management classroom class training, which lasts two or three days. If someone asks me a question on day one or two that I can't answer, I am allowed to say, I don't know. I will find out. I will look it up. I'll get back to you. And I will spend my evening checking every source I can in order to find the answer. If it is a one-shot thing and people are not coming back the next day, you don't have that option. So you have to decide, do you feel comfortable telling your paying clients, I can't answer your question, I don't know this? Or are you going to make up an answer and risk being wrong? Or how do you approach this? Because they will think of something you didn't know. In a demo, that's deadly. So there's a role of... Um, inspiration, but making it up as you go along. If I cannot answer the question, I will find a way around it in order to give something that will satisfy the potential client. 
So there's there's a little bit of game playing there that has to happen. In training, as far as I'm concerned, that's not allowed. If I tell you this is the way something is, you have to believe me, and it has to be verified afterwards. If you find out afterwards that I was, I nearly said a rude word there, if I was making things up that are not true, um, if I was trying to persuade you that I know more than I do, you will lose faith, you will lose confidence, and today you cannot afford that. We used to say that an unhappy customer will tell 10 people, a happy customer will tell one. Today that's not true anymore. An unhappy customer, thanks to the miracles of things like Twitter and Facebook, is going to tell millions of people immediately. If I complain about my telephone company or about the train service or about anything, I can spread that out to the whole world instantly. So an unhappy customer today will tell millions of people at the speed of electricity. An happy customer, if you're lucky, will talk to one person. You're not allowed to fail anymore. Got that, Peter. And, you know, I, uh, I see a very interesting parallel to what you said, where if, you know, like you said, that if you have a one shot training where people are not coming back, then you better be, you know, more prepared to anticipate the kind of questions that are asked to you or at least create some kind of a safe environment where people feel free to check for, uh, you know, clarifications. And I feel this is where, you know, the e-learning or the online learning world also needs to be very sensitive about because typically most of the work that you know is happening in the market in the industry is a one-time training module not too many uh, continuous learning plans are in place for most of the trainings that are happening so what would you say from a quality standpoint is that a subject that uh, from a quality standpoint that people need to be aware of if they are designing a one-shot training vis-a-vis -vis if they're designing continuous uh, learning programs where you know, the learners have the ability to come back. And I just hope that in your presentation today, you, uh, you know, you are able to, uh, you know, shed some light on this area and learning designers could, you know, pick up some tips and tricks uh, to know that if they are going to talk about a subject, how do they, uh, you know, one, anticipate questions. And second, if they if there are questions that are not anticipated, what is the way around that? So from a quality standpoint, what is it that one can do? We would love to hear uh, that as well in your presentation today, Peter. I'll do my best to cover most of that. And if there is anything on the last slide, I am putting my email address. I am happy for people to ask me questions afterwards if they don't have the chance to do it uh, today. So I'm, I'm sharing that with you. I am standing behind what I am saying here. I believe that what I am saying is correct. And I hope if you prove me wrong in anything that I'm saying, you'll have my email address. I'd love to hear from you because I will acknowledge my mistakes. We all make mistakes. Covering up your mistakes is an unacceptable thing. So I'd love to hear if I got something wrong. Peter, I'm very excited uh, for your presentation. I will now hand it over to you to uh, talk about your experience, what has uh, brought you to where you are today, and talk about quality and what it is learning designers can learn from it. OK. So um, I'm, I'm speaking to you from England, a rather dull and drizzly day in England, but then most of them are. And I just want to talk about some of the, the importance of quality and some tricks and techniques in order to make it happen. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction overview explaining why I am here, why it is important. I'd like to then go through some why quality is critical and is needed talk about the three aspects of designing the course, building the course, and then selling the course. So the marketing aspect has to be considered during the design phase 
Then we'll talk about the delivery of the course and some necessary tips for that aspect as well. Before we go into the detail of things, I just want to establish more in detail who I am, why I believe it is critical to change the way e-learning is designed. I put up here uh, one note that says e-learning doesn't work. That is my first challenge to you of saying something controversial in order to get your attention. So I've worked in a number of different roles, professionally and personally. I have always considered that I have to deliver quality. People are placing their trust in me, are paying attention to me, and want to be able to know they can trust me. Um, you might not be able to see it, but this picture here is a picture where I am. I'm giving a talk at a conference. It was, um, I was given the smallest room in the conference and uh, most participants, over half the people there came to listen to me standing, sitting on the floor. It was the smallest room and the other speakers complained that I had stolen most of the participants. So I believe it has to be done. I believe quality is incredibly important. I've worked for 40 years in a variety of companies, small and large, doing a number of different tasks, mostly in IT and in consultancy work. You've probably heard of some of these companies. Most of my time has spent working on educating and training people, mostly face to face. My courses normally include a mix of theory and a lot of getting people to do the work themselves focusing on practical work that they can actually make a change. As a consultant, coach, auditor, instructor, I've worked with large companies, small companies. I've worked on every continent except South America. Most of my time is spent designing and developing courses, presentations, and exercises. And this is normally done through a combination of mind maps and graphic works. I love a good large whiteboard. I have a whiteboard in my dining room because that is the way I think about things. I've spoken at conferences around the world, um, done a TEDx conference, and got a few illustrations here. Some of them have been recorded and are available online. I'm busy consolidating them, trying to get them all into my own YouTube channel. I have uh, written three books. I'm busy in the process of writing the fourth one. Two of them are referenced here. The third one is currently at the publishers being reviewed for publication. My next one is going to be on Vitruvian quality which covers the need and principles of consistent quality at every level of the organization. I'm an amateur artist. This might not seem important, but my work in IT has defined me as an engineer working on understanding statistics, measuring, planning, building things up. My work as an artist focuses on the creative side on the inventiveness and on doing things that have not been done before. So the combination of both of those plus the time I have spent on stage has helped me a lot in understanding training. Right, I said just now e-learning doesn't work. There's unfortunately a number of reasons why e-learning is not successful. The first one is that employees are not given the time to do e-learning. It is required for their job. However, during office hours, they're expected to be productive and not learning things. This means that their learning is done during their family time, their recuperation time. As a consequence, depending on the statistics you look at, the most optimistic statistics I found is that only about 10% of people who start an online course actually finish it. And even among those, it is recognized and accepted 
that online, uh, face to face courses are on average 75% more effective in helping you remember and apply what you have learned. Why is this? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, it comes down basically to the absence of social networking and peer support. The learner is isolated and is therefore easily open to distractions. At the same time, the instructor is not aware of the level, interests, competencies or needs of the students and cannot respond or adapt the course in real time to respond or react to the level of understanding that is perceived. In addition to that, we need quick and colorful situations to all our problems. As I say here, we have moved from Mechano, which involves little pieces and screws and patience, to Lego culture, where everything is quick and bright and easy. I would like in the following minutes to give you some suggestions on capturing and keeping your learners' interests more effectively, because it is a challenge. Before we do that, I'd like to talk about why quality is so important. We don't understand what quality is. Defining quality has been one of my challenges for many years and in many different organizations. It's just something that seems to be there. Defining quality is a channel, a challenge but then turning that definition into something that is useful is close to inconceivable for many organizations. They just don't understand how it is that you can design and build quality rather than just promising it. So let's start by asking what is quality? Quality is something that is really planned. Many people talk about it, but it is really only ever recognized by its absence. We complain about the lack of quality, but we don't think beforehand how we are going to build it into the product. This is critical problem. If you cannot define it, you are not going to be able to deliver it. Your customers might be complaining about quality because you are promising things to your clients and you don't understand yourself what it means. I'm going to give you two forms of definitions of quality. One is that quality is satisfaction. And the second is that quality is happiness. And then we can start working on it, starting with concept of satisfaction. Quality first and foremost, is a satisfied client. The satisfaction of your client is an obvious demonstration that you have built a quality product or service. You need to understand how do you satisfy clients? Clients are satisfied through good products and services. Okay, I'm cheating a little bit here because the word good probably means the same as quality. But let's move on. Good products and services are achieved through successful projects. And so here I'm using the word successful. How do you measure success? Probably, again, it is a question of quality. It is a question of good. It is a question of satisfaction. But successful projects are a bit more specific. Spe successful projects depend on the people doing the work. Success is not dependent on your standards, certifications, or theories. It is entirely dependent on the people doing the work and the value that those people are adding to your products and services. And that means that satisfaction is a job well done. If you are doing a good job, you will feel a level of satisfaction in the work. And I can directly relate your level of satisfaction with the work you are doing 
to the quality of the result. Satisfaction will come at least partly from the fact that you can concentrate on building new products and services and delivering them. You're spending less of your time fixing things and trying to correct things that should already have been working and should already have satisfied the client. The idea that you are delivering quality, that you are investing in quality, means you will actually get more time. Also, quality of your product will depend on the fact that you feel you can progress, that you can do things without being blamed for mistakes. Mistakes are a direct result of creativity. If you don't make mistakes, you're probably not doing anything useful. So experimentation is appreciated, blames are not done, and this leads to the fact that satisfaction reduces stress. Stress, for me, is the great destroyer of worlds. Of course, we have a problem here because satisfaction doesn't just happen. Satisfaction needs to be designed. It needs to be managed, planned, developed, and deployed. Only then can you actually achieve your job satisfaction and your client satisfaction. I also mentioned earlier on quality is happiness. One of the key metrics of quality is the job satisfaction of the people doing the work. If you are going home at the end of the day satisfied you have done a good job, you probably have done a good job. If you feel unsatisfied, stressed, unhappy, either you are not doing a good job or your level of satisfaction and happiness is not aligned to that of the organization you are trying to please. That means you are creating something that doesn't satisfy you because it doesn't satisfy your clients or your hierarchy. So just going through why I want to spend a lot of time and why I have spent so many years talking about quality. The first aspect of this is you are working in a global market. There are people all over the world who can deliver the same products and services as you. Some of these can probably do it better than you. Some can do it cheaper than you. If you don't understand the level of quality, you will be losing your clients rapidly because somewhere else I can find better, I can find cheaper. You need to persuade me why I want to trust you. Defining, designing, building quality requires some additional early activities. It should be understood you're investing time and effort in the cheap phases of your work so that you can save time and effort during the expensive sections. It's easy to correct a mistake when it's only a piece of paper. It's a lot harder when it is something that the customer is already using. Your productivity increases by taking time to design things correctly. Getting people to do the job correctly will directly increase their job satisfaction, will reduce the amount of rework they need to do, and will please your customers, your staff, your learners. So, I said quality is nobody knows what it is. It is something that is complained about, but not done. So how can I possibly design and define it in? The first thing you need to understand is what it is we mean by quality. Quality is not yours to control. Quality is a relationship between someone you don't know and a product that doesn't yet exist. Ultimately, quality is whatever your clients say it is today. And that is your challenge. So the first thing we need to try to understand is what is your client's viewpoint? What are your client's needs? 
you might have a very lofty understanding as to what your work is and how to uh, how good quality you deliver it. You might have this lovely view of your product. But when you get down into the nitty gritty and the clients are down there in the fog trying to figure things out, everything changes. I have defined quality many years ago using a very simple formula. So far, nobody has managed to prove it wrong. Q equals P on X. That means that quality is what you produce divided by what your clients expect. Quality is your client's perception of the value you bring them. This means that before anything else, you need to have a good understanding of your client's needs. That means you need to take the time to examine the facts and figures, the data you have. You have to listen to them to make sure you understand what are their requirements, their expectations, and their needs. And you have to negotiate as to what is possible. Managing expectations is probably one of the more important features that gets forgotten in knowing your audience. You then need to add value to your client's life or business. You need to ensure there's a clear focus on delivering a perception of quality that is above and beyond what you believe should be their quality. The initial perceived quality is basically satisfying requirements and expectations, what your clients believe would be useful. But then you have got the realized value. That is a lot more important, and that is where we are generating client satisfaction, where they suddenly realize that what you are delivering is significantly better than what they were expecting. Bringing this together, understand that your initial perceived quality may attract clients, but your realized quality retains your clients and allows you to grow your market. Now to define quality, you need to define who you want to be. If you want to be the best in the world, that's fine. This was a poster in 2015, which allowed people passers by to get free beer. Maybe that was the best poster in the world. If you want to be the first on the market, go ahead. This is the first motorcycle ever built by Gottlieb Daimler in 1885. If you want to be the cheapest on the market, in Middleton, Queensland, I find the cheapest Hilton Hotel in the world. That's okay. If you want to be the cheapest, that's fine. That is your definition of quality. It's okay to be whatever it is you want to be, as long as you know it. It is not okay not to know what you want to be, what your quality objectives are. Some 2,000 years ago, a um, Vitruvius, an architect, Roman architect called Vitruvius, defined quality, and his definitions haven't changed much. Very much appreciate. They come down to three basic concepts, which are frumitatis, utilitatis, and venustatis. That means, first of all, reliability. Every developer, every designer, every architect in the world primarily works on the concept of reliability. They need to work, they need to be correct, they need to be factual. The second aspect is usefulness. The work, you have to work on something that our clients will find useful. It must provide the solution to a problem a comfort that was not known before, something that your clients will find useful. The thing that is frequently forgotten is the desirability. You need to make people want your products, your services, your 
classes, your courses. Trusting in their reliability is not enough. That is why a Volkswagen car is sold at a higher price than a Seat, even though they are identical, made in the same factory using the same technologies. Designing quality depends on having understood what it is you're trying to achieve. Let me give you three simple examples. This has been designed by an architect, designed for living. I understand what that means. This has been designed by an engineer and has been designed for working. It is a completely different understanding of what is required for quality. This, on the other hand, has been designed for a poet. It's not good for working. It's not practical for living. It is designed for dreaming. Once I've understood what the objective is, I can build the right thing. When building a new product, when building a new course, we typically focus on estimating the cost and planning how much time, effort, and money is acceptable to invest in building it. The cost, I will say, is pointless if you don't understand the value you are creating. Cost of a lottery ticket is easy. We can find that out in seconds. But what is the value? The value of a lottery ticket is not the prize money. It's not, that's not what they are selling you. The value of a lottery ticket is the dream it is creating. For a few minutes, for a few hours, you can think maybe Monday I'll be a millionaire. Estimating the cost is traditional activity. You're asked by management, you're asked by customers continuously to tell me well, how much is this going to cost? When is it going to be ready? When will you be finished? How much effort is required? Estimating the value is rarely done. It's rarely understood. And this is critical because there is a circle of here of understanding how the value, designing, developing value increases the cost, but allows you to increase the price as well. And you need to find the right balance there. So estimating the value, I want to find out what is the additional bit I'm going to invest into building this product to make it desirable. I need to understand who I am addressing. If I am addressing individuals, what age group? If I am selling courses to companies, what audience am I looking at? Am I trying to address multinationals? Am I trying to address startup companies? Am I trying to address companies that have passed their best? And understanding that I can then start managing what is necessary from the top in order to achieve the value that I want and deploying the tools I need in order to be able to do it. One critical aspect is understanding cause and effect. This graphic I did for a peculiar, particular aspect of quality. The question was, what is impacting the motivation of staff and should we do something about it? The elements on the left side in black are the causes for demotivation. The elements on the right in green are the consequences of poor morale. Once established, it was easier to identify the things that we needed in order to achieve what could needed to be done. If you understand what are the causes and the consequences of different aspects, quality and costs of your product and your engineering, you can start measuring and estimating it. It is not more difficult to estimate the quality or the value of a product than it is to estimate the cost of developing as long as you have understood what quality means to you. When planning for value, you need to understand that cost and value work in opposite ways. Cost is a measured bottom-up aspect. The cost of an development is the total cost of what it means 
to build the product. The value is a top-down approach. I need to understand the quality and the value from the top and then break it down into the various components. The value is a breakdown of the overall value I'm trying to build. Now, as we are talking more specifically about learning and building courses, you need to understand before you design a training class, what are some of the key theories of learning? I'm going to cover up here four basic theories very briefly. There are links, so I'll make the slides available to you afterwards. You can click on the links. Number one is the Gestalt theory. Learning works best if you can fit what you are learning into something you already know. Just add step to your learning experience. The difference between breaking an egg and adding an egg to your cake is very different. When teaching, you are providing ingredients. But today in e-learning, you probably don't know where your clients are, so you're not sure what you're trying to add to. Different people have different intelligences and understand things in different ways. When you are face-to-face, -face, you can use more techniques in e-learning than you can in than you can in e-learning. You need to replace them with something to help them understand. Face-to-face -face learning, you can control the environment. The environment is critical. The amount of oxygen in the air, the amount of light that is available, all these are critical aspects to a facilitating learning. I strongly recommend you have a look at Stephen Heppel's film um, where he's introducing his new working environment, learning environment. Doing things is usually the best way to learn. Personally, I cannot listen or learn if I don't have a pencil and paper in my hands. I take notes, I doodle, I might never look at them, but I will take notes. It's difficult to do that and remain focused on the screen. So that was the theory. Now let's go down into the details as to designing a course. You need, of course, first of all, to understand the context of your course, understand who are your clients and your participants, what are the objectives of the course and duration. I'm not going to go into that. I'm sure you know that better than I do. You need to understand the message you are trying to deliver. That message should be delivered in three formats, in the introduction of the course, in the course section, and the conclusion. Again, I'll touch on it a little bit later, but that's, I want to start talking about the content. By the way, the mind map on the screen here is this very presentation. It was my first draft of what I was going to talk about. So going into the content of the learning experience, content is about, communication is about reception. You need to communicate. Teaching is all about communicating. If you are not heard, if you are not listened to, if you are not understood, you are not communicating. It's nobody else's fault. In a classroom environment, I can expect to have 20 minutes of attention before I need to do something. In e-learning, you've got seven minutes. After seven minutes, you need to regain the attention. Change the topic, change the delivery, change something in order to get their attention back. Methods of delivery need to be varied. You cannot, um, you're restricted to what you can do in e-learning. I'm illustrating this with a picture of a course I was giving recently. At first sight, it doesn't look particularly fascinating. However, it does illustrate that there are multiple learning cha channels here happening at the same time. First of all, there is speech. I am busy talking about what is happening. I have got illustrations. I'm showing something at the same time. 
I'm getting people to take notes. So you're taking notes, you're writing things down. There are posters, whiteboards, flip charts that are there reminding people of what I'm busy talking about while I'm busy talking about it. I'm using a highlighter to stress some aspect of what I am showing so as to bring more attention to it. And then there are activities and practices. Some of these are very difficult to do in e-learning, but what you can do is, first of all, use graphics. Use graphics in order to illustrate what you are talking about, rather than just repeating the words. Back yourself up with some science, statistics, data. Make sure they are presented in a way that is understandable and entertaining. Presenting spreadsheets full of numbers uh, might be useful if you're addressing economists, but most people would prefer a simple graphic. Sometimes texts can be useful, but it's very difficult. You now have to choose between listening to me or reading the text. If you're giving access to the material afterwards and you want to make sure they have it, that's okay. I mean, this slide looks exaggerated, but trust me, I have seen this being used in a number of different circumstances. Try something different, surprise them. Animation always attracts attention, it's always fun. A lot of effort is put into writing the course and probably too little is put into designing how it is going to be delivered. So put in variety in the delivery. This is very difficult. I am sitting here talking to you without moving. I have been through a course recently, which took approximately for four hours. For four hours, a person stood on the left side of my screen, a slide on the right, and for four hours, she read what was there with no real expression or enthusiasm, okay? Be human, be human, show that you're there, that you care about this stuff. Be careful of culture. Culture is a dramatic thing that we forget. Particularly in e-learning, you don't know who you're addressing, so you need to make special attention to this. Humor is a wonderful tool. Humor always breaks down barriers, makes things happen, but be careful how you use it because you will offend people, okay? What you find funny, is not necessarily what other people find funny. People laugh at different things. Be careful what you're using. Make sure that you're not offending it. There's one subject of humor that you can safely joke about and mock as much as you want in every culture. And that is yourself. You can always mock yourself. Another challenge in e-learning is the cultural aspect, the cultural learning aspect of different people. A great book here called The Culture Map, which I very strongly recommend, which compares different ways in which people react, absorb, and understand knowledge. For instance, if I am trying to persuade people, then I have to understand that some people want to know the theory beforehand, why you're doing this, what is it based. If we're talking to Italians or French people, they very much want to understand the theories that led you to your conclusions. If you're talking to Americans at the other end, they want to understand your conclusions. They want to understand the practical aspect of this, and you can then explain the theory behind it. That was designing. We now go into building the course. I like to compare building presentations and talks like a restaurant 
meal. So we've got three main courses. We've got a starter, we've got a main course, and we've got a dessert. Personally, if I go to a restaurant, I will start by ordering the main course and then establish a starter and dessert that go with it. I'm not going to present it to you like that. I'm going to start here with the starter. But I do recommend you design the main part of your section before you do the introductions and conclusions. So at the starter, the appetizer, you want something relatively light, something that will capture their attention, help them relax into what you're going to say. Tell me why I should listen to you. Tell me what I should expect to get out of this. Again, it's easier face to face. Um, the example I've given here, the whiteboard that I'm showing here, is gathering expectations at the beginning of the workshop in order to make sure I can follow through. The main course, it's appropriate variety. You need a mix of personal stories, theories, practice. Take time to deliver this. This text here on the left is the presentation, this presentation, as I broke it down into time segments and started structuring the workflow. Finally, you finish with the dessert. Make them something, some conclusions, leave them feeling happy. Request feedback. Remember that criticism is an opportunity to improve. It's always nice. And make sure that your guests never leave the table fed up. Make sure they leave the table wanting some more. You don't want them to have indigestion. Then you need to taste your meal before you serve. No chef will let a dish out of the kitchen without ensuring that it tastes correctly. So review the contents, make sure, go through your presentation, check your spelling, capitalization, punctuation. There's no best rule regarding these, but you need to be consistent. Something will be wrong. Something will be wrong in your presentation, which you will only notice while you are delivering it. Don't try to hide it, accept it. We all make mistakes. And on that topic, because some people are going to challenge me for my mix of English and American spelling and things, I just want to point out the Oxford Dictionary, which I consider the highest authority, recommends the use of Z in words ending I-Z-E or I-S-E, um, rather than the what is the French spelling, which has become popular in British English. And then get ready to deliver. Be prepared for the unexpected. Can you continue talking? Can you continue delivering if there is something that goes dramatically wrong? Are you prepared for the technology failure? I once had to keep a workshop going for 45 minutes in complete darkness after a power failure. Put in place references. Throughout my presentation, I have got a number of little references. They're written very small in corners underneath statistics and so on. If you go online afterwards and find the uh, available version of this, which I will be making available, then you will find that these are all clickable links and you can go to where I got the picture or the statistics from. We now come to the next phase, which is marketing your course. If you can't market it, if you can't make it, sell it, you wasted your time. And it's not just marketing, it's not just sales and branding. It is something that you go through the whole design and development to make sure it is desirable. One aspect of this is choosing a title. I was fairly obvious for this one because I know that it's being marketed through a reputable organization, so I could make it a little bit easier. But if, what talk would attract you most? Okay. 
implementing proactive quality assurance or the quality auditor as an obstacle to quality. I chose the second one. It shocks, it intrigues. There are some other titles I've used. Mostly, I try and take things, statements that people don't really know Your what it is. Your screen sharing has been disconnected. Okay, I seem to have run into a problem here. I'm told my screen sharing is disconnected. Uh, Aman, can you confirm I'm still online? Okay, I will continue speaking with we'll fit your sales pitch. Get feedback, ask for feedback. Positive feedback is good for your morale. Negative feedback is useful. The feedback I'm showing here, I've got on the left side, I asked people to tell me what they were taking away from the course. On the right side, I have got what still puzzled them. What were the questions they still had open? This allowed me to understand and improve the course for next time. And then we come finally to the delivery of the course. Never read the slides. If you are reading your slides, either your slides are useless or you are useless. It just shows you don't know your material. Measure the speed of your delivery. Don't rush through your delivery and then say, um, um. Measure your speed. A lot of the people listening to you are not speaking your language as a first language. They need time to process what you are saying. Be alive, be interactive, make sure that things are happening. Be prepared for questions and answers. Are you ready for the iconoclast who is going to publicly demolish you? Know your material. In conclusion, structure your presentation, include mix of theory and practice, this is a lot more difficult than in a classroom. Know your audience, know your topic and your key messages, and make sure that people have fun. Never make any empty commitments. That doesn't help. Hello, learning designers. Uh, sorry about that. Some technical glitch. The uh, you know session got abruptly ended. I think uh, another ten seconds was left of that. I'll request Peter also to come online with us to take up uh, the questions. Guys, feel free to put your questions down in the chat area. Peter is live with us. He's going to be, uh, you know, uh, elaborating on all the questions that we have. Okay, you should have my audio now. I'm trying to get my camera to work. Fantastic, Peter. You should be online anytime now. Yes. Uh, okay. Quick uh, reminders: as uh, Peter comes online, uh, you can also, if you've liked what Peter has shared and you plan to implement it in your own sessions and you would like to get counsel from Peter on if you're going right and if you'd like him to uh, give you uh, you know some advice as to how you could go about it feel free to book a coaching session and we could uh, you know take your interest uh, to him and uh, arrange for that session all right so i seem to be on twice now i don't know what happened <laughs> i think it's been minutes already <laughs> yeah fantastic so, uh, Peter, anything that you saw in the chat role that you want to elaborate on? So I've been trying to answer questions as we went through. Um, I have also put a um, couple of documents in the handouts. 
So there is a uh, checklist of things you need to think about when you are preparing a, a course. And um, it doesn't seem to be there. There was a second one, which doesn't, doesn't seem, seem to be, be there. there. Right. I will try to add that as well, which was a printout of the slides. If you want a um, soft copy of the slides, there is a link in the handout. I don't uh, know if people can get the handout there or not. Uh, so guys, uh, we know the drill. There is a handout section in the chat area. If you just click on that, uh, you will see that there are two PDF documents uh, that are there for you to download. And as Peter is mentioning, one of them is the design checklist. Uh, which will be uh, which will act as a quick reckoner to see if you have checked all boxes. And the second one is the slide presentation that Peter shared. It's called Designing Quality in Learning. So you could download both these um, elements. And these will be available on the replay page as well. So feel free to pick them up if uh, you know, you're not able to download right now. Thank you so much, Isabel. Uh, love that comment. I've learned a lot. We've got Lucas saying, uh, thank you, Peter. Great webinar, good food for thought. So Peter, a lot of kudos coming your way. Um, yes, I know there's only one document. I'm trying to uh, figure out what happened to the second one. It doesn't okay. seem to want me to let me put it the second one. Uh, Christiana, may I say that if you're not able to see it, all, although I can see both of these here, uh, but let me do this. Let me have them uploaded in the replay page. So if you're not able to download it from here, please feel free to come back to the replay page and download it from there. Thank you, Gurpreet, for that comment. Lynn, uh, thank you for your comment. Great presentation. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for the positive comments. Uh, personally, I found the whole presentation very painful. I guess I just hate listening to myself. Um, <laughs> so Peter, I'm just going so, through all the uh, comments in the chat area. Uh, if there is anything that you would like to elaborate on, feel free. Guys, this is the opportunity. Peter is right here live with us. Feel free to ask him any questions at all, uh, of course, pertaining to the topic he presented. OK, yes. Anu just asked, uh, Peter, where did you get the figures from? And you answered it, uh, that you can share the presentation. And the sources were right there. And I think uh, from a quality standpoint, uh, Peter did mention that if you're quoting from somewhere, it makes sense to include the references. Uh, that just makes the information more credible for everyone. Yes, so underneath every graphic, underneath every picture, there is a clickable link which shows you where I stole it from, borrowed it, <laughs> used it. Or got inspired from any way you want to put it. Paul, I read your comment. Great stuff, Peter. Not an e-learning fan personally, but it does cut cost. And let me tell you this, Paul. Uh, you know, I I hear a lot of my clients say the same thing that you know e-learning is so boring, and you know uh, yes. they are not a big fan of e-learning. And my answer always is to them that you haven't met a good e-learning designer, and that's why you say that. So you know, we uh, we are big fans of e-learning. All of us are. It you know not only it does it cut cost, but uh, you know uh, in the domain that we work in, uh, we we make e-learning more effective than what classroom trainings will ever be. So. That's a big statement, I know, and I'm going to be sharing some of uh, you know my work uh, in one of the sessions uh, that is planned on how do we create business impact with uh, e-learning and specifically e uh, digital learning design. Okay, so we've got uh, Bogdan here. How to predict early in the production process the quality of the output? Great question, Peter. Your thoughts on that? A tough question, a tough question. Um, obviously, if you want to predict the quality of the output, uh, you need to have a very clear understanding, not just of what is expected, but what your participants actually need. 
And I think that was my problem with this presentation. It's very public, it's very open. And I really didn't have any idea whether I am talking to beginners or seasoned professionals. And so I felt I needed to cover more than probably was necessary for most people. So um, the quality, the quality can be predicted, but you need to have a clear, I, I come back to the formula that I mentioned earlier, Q equals P on X. You need to have a good understanding of the expectations and beyond that, the needs of your uh, attendees, of your students, in order to be able to deliver the right level of quality. You can also, and I must admit, I think it was my weakness in this, in the film you've just been watching, you also need to repeat it, rehearse it again and again and again, watch yourself, film yourself doing it, and understand what are your weaknesses, where you are uh, missing out on things, where you are not being success, su uh, sufficiently succinct. That's not an easy thing to say. Um, but of course, quality is always difficult to predict because it very much depends on the mood of your participants. So what might be considered quality by one person will be considered bad by another one. Uh, the, some people will find what you're presenting is too technical. Others will find it's too superficial. And so that's, that's one of the challenges with e-learning to predict the right level you need. But it can be done if you know who you're addressing. And Peter, uh, if uh, you know, if you allow me, I will just share my two cents as well because you know I run a studio where uh, we have to do production for e-learning and for video content for uh, various clients. And I would say this, and I'm no expert on quality. Really, we do get a lot of feedback, and there is a lot of iteration. And you know, uh, not to say that you know what comes out of my studio is always the best, but you know, we try to put in our best effort there. And one of the techniques that we follow here is that uh, we know how the production process is going to look like. We divide it into milestones. For each milestone, we identify some dissatisfiers and some delighters. And this is an effort we have to put in up front. So for example, if you're doing e-learning, then you know that um, you know content scoping and content treatment documents are going to be part of the first phase of the e-learning. So what are going to be some dissatisfiers for the client? I, as a owner of that process, must be able to articulate what are some dissatisfiers that I need to look for before my documents go out. What are some delighters that I know is going to make my customers happy? Are they in there? So, you know, the next phase is going to be storyboarding. So even for storyboarding uh, phase, what is it that is going to dissatisfy my client? What is it that is going to delight my client? So, you know, creating uh, more than creating, I would say articulating these objectives for each milestone before you sit down to review uh, how the, uh, you know, process is turning out in different phases. I think that really has helped us uh, a lot over the years in in terms of being able to understand what our clients want, what the customers want, and uh, be able to articulate it in these two specific terms that we use in our studio, dissatisfiers and delighters. So, uh, you know, not to say again, the caveat here is I'm no expert in quality. I keep learning every day and, uh, you know, there is no end to how much you can achieve in quality. But that said, it, uh, you know, helps us stay aligned and calibrated that we are not, you know, grossly off track. And ask for feedback, read all your feedback, use your feedback. There, there's the positive feedback makes you feel all nice and warm inside and is good for your, for your ego. But the useful feedback is the constructive one. Anybody who criticizes what you have done has a reason to criticize it. And that's something you need to learn from and you need to improve next time around. So negative feedback is incredibly important for quality. Absolutely. And I will just call out Douglas Gilbert here, who's just called out the model, uh, which is the Cano model for quality, which is really the industry standard when it comes to uh, teaching people about quality or just adhering to a certain framework and Cano model there is just 
close to perfect, where it gives you this sense of you know dissatisfiers, delighters, and uh, you know basic hygiene and stuff like that. So fantastic, Douglas. Thank you for uh, pitching with that. All right. So Peter, I think. Uh, uh, guys, uh, last few minutes before we close this session, please feel free to uh, put in your questions if there are any. Uh, and you could also share any challenges uh, that we currently face with quality in terms of the learning products that we create. Of course, much of the production is going digital, so we want to be uh, you know, uh, sure about the quality of digital production. That's a delighter for our clients. Second piece always will remain that you know, training in the classroom. How do I, as a facilitator, deliver high quality sessions? And you know, one of the things that I really picked up from Peter in the way he articulated it was to you know, think of the menu that you know and this is you know i love these metaphors that you know make things easy for us to understand that you know you have an appetizer to begin with you have the main course and the dessert so a simple metaphor but it gives you some structure as to what you should be saying first what you should be keeping for the main course and what is it that you know will leave uh, people a good taste in the mouth when they walk out so you know fantastic metaphors it's and i understand that you know being a learning designer myself that not every time when you get caught up in the content and you're constantly dealing with audience and client that you it, there is no time to go and refer back to any model at that time but i think these metaphors stay with us longer and uh, you know help us stay aligned to uh, you know our, our purpose of why we are doing what we are doing so with that fantastic Peter, we'll close on to this webinar. Thank you so much, guys, for joining in. I see that uh, uh, the number of people who started with us are the same at the end. So uh, you know, it's a good reflection for me that uh, good indicator that the session session was engaging. People found a lot of value. Guys, feel free to uh, you know comment and to share your love on Facebook and. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, if you're liking these sessions, there are so many more sessions that are planned for you guys in the coming few days. So if you haven't already signed up for those, take this opportunity, look through those sessions, look at the videos, the intro videos of those sessions and sign up for those. And uh, for this session, Peter, thank you so much for being live with us. Taking all sessions. And it's a pleasure to have you in the summit as a speaker. And with that, uh, we'll close on to this webinar. Guys, we'll see you soon on the next session. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.